Seldom do people race their way to glory, but speed bodes well for some. And stepping onto the right track, right from his teenage years, this young boy accelerated and how to become the fastest Indian on wheels in the world. He's been an inspiration for millions of budding racers and he has proven that no motorsport stage is unachievable. I'm talking about none other than India's ace racer, Naren Kartikeyan. Thank you so much for joining us, Naren. Truly a pleasure sitting in your humble abode to recount your journey. Thank you. Uh, so let me go back to uh, you know your childhood years. I'm given to believe uh, that you know racing was in your family, uh, with your father a racer, your uncle a racer, and also I believe that Coimbatore uh, breeds a lot of racers. I was born in Chennai, but obviously I was brought up in Coimbatore, and this this is where my roots are. And my family lives here. My father used to be a very successful rally driver in the uh, 70s and early 80s. So I kind of grew up in a motorsport environment. Um, Coimbatore, uh, to this day, um, you know, it is the motorsport hub of uh, yeah. India. Uh, we make a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of race cars gets manufactured here. Uh, many of the successful uh, racing and rally drivers come from Coimbatore. Sure. So I, I suppose those days, you know, the, you know, it's, it, it wasn't like today when I was growing up. Uh, there were a lot fewer things you could do right. and you were surrounded by a lot of people who were involved in prepping cars and so on and so forth. So uh, I guess it was natural that, you know, I kind of got into the sport. And when I was 10 years old, I suppose I said um, to myself and to everyone else, I want to be a Formula One driver, not knowing how difficult it's going to be. Uh, because, uh, you know, at that time in India, I mean, I'm sure you know, 0.001% knew what Formula One was sure. all about. Yeah. So the exposure was so minimal that there used to be a, uh, a racing at the Sholavaram uh, Astrip once a year. Okay. And it was called the National Races. Okay. It was in the month of February, two weekends. And that was the racing for the season. Oh, so, okay. Okay. so just two weeks, two weekends of racing. So uh, we've come a long way now, but uh, those days Right. So, by the age of 10, you were, you know, clear in your head, as clear as a child can be, saying that I wanted to be an F1 driver. Uh, but as you went on further, uh, and when you, uh, you know, told your parents in a serious manner that this is what you want to pursue, uh, given that, you know, uh, those days, I'm talking about the early 90s, where, you know, this was not looked at as a safe and set profession, at least being an Indian. Right. Uh, were there any uh, rumblings or with your parents saying that, you know, you can do this as a hobby, but there's something else you need to pursue as your mainstay? So, in their minds, in their, I mean, the as I told you, there was races once a year. Yeah. Right? So, it was more of a, you know, a, a young boy's dream to drive those races. Sure. And... I don't think one took it very seriously that one could be a professional race car driver from India. Yeah. Um, so I suppose in their minds, in their heads, it was like, okay, he's going to do these races and that's it. He lose interest beyond yeah. the point, right? He, because there's, there are no opportunities, sure. right? So, sure. um, but then what happened was <clears throat> I got enrolled into, my father said, okay, you want to race cars, but you need to go to a driving school, a racing school. Uh, so, I got enrolled in the <coughs> very famous uh, Winfield Racing School in France. Okay. Uh, this was in 92. And um, uh, for some reason, I was really fast. And then I got a scholarship to move on. Wow, okay. <coughs> in Europe. Uh, so, I, I, in my, so at that, I think it gave me more confidence. Uh, 92, say, how old were you? I was uh, 15 years old. So you got a scholarship? Yes. And you got a scholarship to move on further? Yeah, I got a scholarship uh, to do the, the next level of the racing school. Okay. Um, after which... Um, were you the only Indian in the school? I was the only Asian. Asian, uh, okay. There were not, you know, no other Japanese or, you know, because Japan, there's a big culture of racing from sure. the 50s. Sure, sure. Um, but in this group, there were Americans, Canadians and uh, one Indian. Until that time, I thought, you know, it, 
it's, you know, it's going to be, you know, quite easy to uh, to go through the racing uh, ladder. Sure. But uh, I think it was the first time I realized that the sport is very European, um, and you know, some South Americans as well. They've been successful, but mainly, you know, for the uh, developed countries, I would I would say, and uh, they didn't look up on down upon me but I had the sense that you know you look different your color is different and so on and so forth so um, it gave me a little bit of uh, a mountain to climb I would say okay. you know how about I, fitting in sorry fitting in with 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 the other children fitting in with the other teenagers was uh, not so bad the Americans were quite friendly but what I realized was they were all much fitter than I was I was this puny little guy um, and we Indians look even uh, younger when you know right. at that age so they were all you know m looked much more physically tough and and so on but I think mentally I was very strong um, so that that kind of helped me go through uh, the school the racing school and um, I came out top of these uh, 30 30 other guys who were there but, um, top meaning the best lap times uh, we, do, we they, they didn't allow us to race it was against the clock, okay. so I, I clocked the best uh, uh, lap time in that group and that's how I got the scholarship to move to the next level. And then what happened? Uh, so I raced in England, uh, the first time an Indian went out there uh, to Europe and started racing. Uh, the results were quite good in 94 uh, in Formula Ford, that's the, that's the grassroots level of racing okay. while, uh, during that time. Uh, it, there, it was very, very clear path those days. So you had Formula Ford, uh, then you had um, uh, Formula Ford 2000 or Formula Opel Lotus, then you had Formula 3, uh, Formula 3000 and Formula 1. Okay. Now there are a lot many more categories of racing. Uh, so I started off there, I won the British uh, Formula Ford Winter Series Championship. Wow. And then you know, racing is a very, very expensive sport. Yeah. Um, so, I, as I told you earlier, the understanding of motorsport was, you know, insignificant in India. Um, and uh, sponsorship were very, very hard to come by. So, I had to kind of come back uh, to India. Um, and normally, each driver, uh, every driver from, uh, you know, different countries, they're backed by the, their, their corporates. But in India, was you know that never yeah. I could never dream of that happening and but luckily for me uh, there was a, a new series emerging in Asia called Formula Asia at that time okay um, and Philip Morris were trying to come into India okay uh, and they wanted a young driver from this part of Asia to uh, you know try and uh, don the colors sure sure so I was sponsored by Marlboro Wow. And uh, and I, I got a drive in the Asia Championship, Formula Asia Championship. So, 95 I did a few races and 96 I won the championship, the Asian Championship. Okay, wow. Uh, yes, and then, um, you know, then again you had to, if you want to go to Formula 1, you have to go back to Europe. Okay. Uh, so, I had to go to Europe, but again there was not enough funding. What kind of commitment are we talking about, just to get a sense? I think in, uh, we were talking about $100,000 in, in 1996, uh, wow. 97, um, so that's uh, a lot of money even yeah. now. Yeah, so, of course. Um, but uh, anyway, I had my lucky break in 99. Um, uh, I had the sponsorship from the Tata Group. Uh, so they but so before 99, when you were, let's say, knocking on yeah. different corporates to get, uh, tell me about that phase. So Kingfisher uh, came on board and this partly supported me in 97 and 98. But the, you had no periods of frustration where... Of course, uh, you see the, how the you know, drivers from other countries operate, uh, you know, uh, it was, you know, I, maybe in some times I did think that the sport is not for us. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean, yeah. right? But then it kept going. We, I found a way to drive a few races, sometimes not the full championship, okay. just a few races to, you know, keep it going and sure, to, sure. Um, and in those few races I could impress and I could get some uh, decent results, mm -hmm. uh, podiums and mm -hmm. 
and I got one win in '97 uh, in in a in a higher category. So in Europe, uh, so that was uh, that was kind of a '97 '98 was pretty tough. Uh, no, wasn't a full season, part seasons. Then I did a few races in Formula Three, uh, which is the stepping stone to the that is the true the first level of professional motor racing. Formula Three is okay. is where Formula One teams take notice of drivers. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, so in Formula Three, I was straight away fast, um, qualified third in my fourth race, um, and um, um, I had to stop because there was lack of funding. funding. So in '99, I had a lucky break. Um, I met Mr. Tata, and um, uh, from that day until today, I work with the Tatas. They still support me, wow. and I've had a great relationship with them. And it's been 20, almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, so um, I had now I had the backing of a big group in India. Um, so I started doing really well. Um, drove one two races in Formula Three. You need a super license to get into Formula One. Okay. Um, and then I went to the Formula Three World Cup. I got pole position there uh, in Macau um, and uh, and Korea. I did well. So it was called the FIA Intercontinental Cup. Uh, FIA is our uh, world, the sanction body, okay. uh, equivalent to an ICC. Okay. Uh, so that's how I got my super license in 2000. In so 2000. I had the pa I had the passport to go drive in Formula One. When I was researching you, I believe you have openly talked about this one regret you have had in 2000, which was you made, I think, a silly mistake yes. uh, in Macau, if I remember. Yes, so I had, I had pole position, uh, the fastest, uh, you know, during the qualifiers. Right. Which means you get uh, grid one. Um, but then I was leading by seven seconds, uh, set a new lap record, and I think over eagerness or enthusiasm or not mature enough, I made an error and crashed. It's a street circuit, so uh, if you go off, if you make a tiny mistake, then you hit the wall. So wow. I did that, and um, uh, I lost that race. And and that race uh, in '83, uh, were, the same race was won by Atten Senna. Wow. In 1990, it was won by Michael Schumacher when they were all in Formula Three. Wow. So it was a very very big deal to have you know put your name there. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, that's a big regret uh, for myself. Um, I couldn't make that happen. I regret it uh, even now. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, what happened after Macau? But you did manage a pole position. Yes, I managed pole position. So it was a uh, it's a double header. So we had a race in South Korea after that. The okay. following weekend, which I dominated, I had pole position and I won. Okay. Um, and then uh, and because of these performances, Formula One teams started noticing me. Okay. And Jaguar F1 team was the first team to give me a test drive. Wow. So I was the first Indian in 2001 to go and uh, test drive in an official Formula One team. Um, and that went well. Straight away I was called by the Jordan Grand Prix team to do two further two more tests um, in 2001. Um, so I did that. You get paid for all this, right? No, 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 no. Only you don't get paid. So uh, how do you make money? So it's only when you break into Formula One as a full-time driver. Okay. That's when you, when you, you know, start making some money. So uh, this is just the build-up to making yes, money. Yes. Yes. So you were basically not making any income during those days. No, it was very difficult. Even though I had uh, sponsors like Tata and so on. Um, as I told you, it was even in Formula 3 days, you had to buy the chassis and, mm. and so many other things, the engine contract for the year. Um, you were talking about 300,000 pounds. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was very difficult to kind of, uh, you know, I had to, my parents were kind enough to support my living sure, uh, sure. in the UK, which is Oh, again, quite yeah, expensive. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was that, and and after which, uh, 2005, I made my Formula One debut with the, with the Jordan Grand Prix team. Now, was that does that mean that now you're a full-time 
a Formula One driver? Yes, I was yeah, a full-time Formula One driver in 2005. Wow. Made my debut in Melbourne at okay. the Australian Grand Prix. Okay. Um, and yes, at the time, the likes of Michael Schumacher, all the Rubens Barrichello and so on were driving. Um, so I was one amongst them. Um, you were racing with them? Yeah, I ra was wow. racing with them. Wow. Um, and uh, the qualifying day was wet in, uh, in, in Australia, in Melbourne. But um, I managed to qualify 11th uh, on the grid, few places in front of Schumacher. Wow. Uh, so that was a very uh, uh, confidence boosting experience, I, would, uh, sure. I, sh I should say. Uh, so that's how it all started off. But Jordan Grand Prix was a successful team and then Formula One is again, you need a lot of sponsorship and so on and so forth. So they were struggling at that time uh, uh, to attract big sponsors. Okay. So our performance kept going down. Uh, gradually we couldn't develop uh, the cars as much as a, a top team uh, like a Ferrari or a McLaren sure. uh, or, and so on. So uh, it was a, quite a tough season but I managed uh, to get a few points. Uh, and still uh, the only Indian uh, to have done that. And then, you know, I continued in Formula One in one form or the other in five, six, seven. Then uh, I had to move on to the A1 GP. A1 GP? Yes. That's not Formula One? That's, that was a new concept. Um, it was called the A1 GP World Cup of Motorsport. So countries, uh, all, uh, countries competed against each other with similar equipment. Countries? Yes. So, so India, I, I drove India, for India, okay. I, then there were drivers from Germany who drove for their nation okay. and, okay. and okay. yeah. But what happened to Formula One after Jordan? After Jordan, I, I became a test driver with Williams okay. um, in 2006 and 7. Okay. One of the most successful Formula One teams in the world. Right. Um, so I was de basically developing the racing cars for the regular drivers, uh, R&D, uh, research okay. and development and so on. Uh, but then that didn't convert into a full-time race, race seat. Uh, so I had to look at uh, other forms of racing. Um, because Why did it convert? Because Japanese drivers came with a huge uh, backing of Toyota. Okay. Uh, and they supplied Williams with the gearbox and the engines. And you, I mean, you, could, you didn't stand a chance. So, okay, Williams didn't convert. And so you were looking at alternate, alternate forms of racing. Yes. Which, so you were talking about the uh, the auto. Uh, so a, so I, I drove in the A1 GP. The the uh, it was a new concept uh, promoted by the Al Maktoum family from Dubai. Dubai okay. Um, so 22 countries participated in it, and India was one amongst those countries. A lot of developed nations in racing in the field of motor racing were competing, and uh, we won two races, one in China and one in UK. When the GP came to India in 2011, what about what were your thoughts? Obviously, I was really happy, and I thought in my lifetime it, this will never happen, but mm. it did happen. Mm. But um, I think the promoters were a little bit blinded by the whole Formula One thing, and uh, they got short changed, in my opinion. Um, they built a fantastic facility, uh, but unfortunately, after the after three races, uh, uh, you know, the whole group has got into problems and. Uh, uh, I still feel that India is not ready for Formula One. Is it? Uh, yeah, uh, in many ways. Um, Why do you say that? Because it's just lack of interest and, uh, you know, Force India is a team, but it's not really an Indian team. Um, it's, uh, you know, mostly now controlled by the Mexicans. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of... Uh, but even for like, for instance, when the GP was happening in 2011, you were not really representing Force India, were you? No, I was driving for a Spanish team, yeah. uh, the Hispania racing team. Obviously, they don't exist anymore because the Spain had, had gone through the economic crisis in 11 and 12. And, and when we finished off the 2012 season, they, they, went, you know, they went bankrupt as well, mm -hmm. the team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unfortunately, that was the end of my Formula One uh, career. Yeah. Um, and I chose to race in Japan because it's the... Uh, one of the most popular sports there and uh, the technology and it, it kind of goes in with what I do. I do a lot of R&D for the Tata, for Tata Motors. Right. I've always wondered, I mean, Formula One, we have, I mean, today, of course, uh, uh, you know, 
he's synonymous with uh, for grabbing all the wrong headlines but Vijay Malia was you know at all the races so did you never and he's also from down south so the proximity is also there yeah. did you not knock the the doors of King Fisher to come on board yeah uh, Vijay Malia actually was one of my early sponsors in 97 and 98 when you know he gave part of the sponsorship so at least I could keep my you know I, I told you I did part seasons mm. in Formula 3 so he was he did support me but then um, you know come uh, for some reason uh, you know he didn't want to uh, even try out Indian drivers so, uh, I don't know it was very strange for me I just couldn't um, you know figure out I still can't figure out why. Which year was this? This was when he bought the racing team in 2008. Eight, right? Yeah. So it would have ideally, I mean, it would have been a perfect marriage, ideally. Ideally it was, uh, it could have been, uh, but it never was. Uh, and never, I think the intention was um, clearly not to have an Indian driver uh, in their strategy. For wow, so we were racist to ourselves. I, I wouldn't go to saying that he was racist or whatever. It's his team, end of the day. He can mm. put a monkey to drive. <laughs> so, um, you know, I suppose in some ways uh, he could have, you know, tried, tried to see how good I was. At least given me a, a, a shot. test. Yeah. yeah. But did you, did you approach him? Of course we did. Yeah, did. He, was, he was the... Uh, chairman of the Indian Feder Motorsport Federation. Right, right, uh, right. So, right. We, of course, we did, and he knows us pretty well. He knows my family well, and he knows everybody well. So, it's not for the lack of trying. That's for sure from our, my side. But, uh, but for what? Uh, for probably commercial reasons, or I don't know, or whatever. That know? that that is very strange. Also, you not representing Force Force India was also very strange. Yeah, yeah. Many people in our country think I drove for Force India, but uh, uh, but uh, the, it was never to be. Was um, would you, was it political? What was the what was the were, were there like uh, what were the stakes involved that was making it like uh, 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 you know the first the first Formula One driver of the country? See, you you only read uh, you know statements made in the media, so I don't sure. know how far this is true and. Sure. Malia always felt that we were not as fast as uh, European drivers, uh, so he keeps saying that. So, uh, but uh, it is disappointing that you know that you know you're the only Indian driver there, and you don't you have a Indian team, and you don't want to you know see you know at least test and see how fast you are. So, yeah. that was very strange for me. I want to talk about uh, the time where you know you had a. Uh, 2014 where you got into a, a serious accident and that kind of toll it took on you uh, emotionally and physically. Uh, tell me about what happened. Well, I was uh, racing the Super Formula Series. I've been racing ever since 2014 um, uh, in Japan and I had a nasty accident at the Autopolis circuit exiting the final corner. Um, it was a flat out uh, left-hander. I think we were doing should be around 230 kilometers an hour and I lost the car. Uh, we suspect uh, the tire pressures were low and then the car bottomed out and I didn't have any more steering. So it was a pretty heavy impact, broke, cracked my helmet uh, and so on. But, uh, and then I had a, it, I got knocked out. Uh, I had a broken ribs. Wow. Uh, my back was, uh, my lower back had a nasty injury as well. So more than the mental, uh, you know, pressures, the, it was more physical, you know, to kind of get out of this injury and get back to fitness. How long did it take? It took me almost a year, uh, but I had to keep racing. So every time you raced, it became worse. And then it you were racing never, despite the injuries? Yeah, I'd never had the time to heal because you don't want to really, you know, kind of the sport is, there are so many others, you know, there are very, very few seats. People, drivers always keep looking for seats and when, once you get out of it, it's very, very difficult to get in. Um, so, you just, you know, take your painkillers, shots and just keep going. So, what would be your advice to anybody who's dreaming to take the racing route? 
I mean, you need to dream big. You have to go after your dreams, I suppose. And, you know, I've done, I've made it yeah. all the way to the top. Right, right. I'm living my dream. So, you know, why not? You know, you, uh, you, there, there will be others. Um, and it's only, I suppose, a matter of time. Fair enough. On that note, thank you so much, Narin Kartik. And truly, uh, what a phenomenal journey. Thank you for taking time out. Thank you. And all the very best for your innings as a racer. Thank you very much. Thank you.